What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Onyx Reports Daily Black Masculinist News. Hope everybody's well. Please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and join the channel. Please support us so that we can continue to develop this conversation about black men and really kind of highlight what many aspects of the black male experience is, right? So today, we're going to be looking at a piece about a Louisiana man, right, who was just released after serving 20 years for stealing two shirts, right? So you can find this on msn.com, right? It says, in September 2000, Guy Frank was caught stealing two shirts from a Saks Fifth Avenue in New Orleans. Stolen clothing was almost immediately returned to the department store, but the consequences of his crime, then considered a felony in Louisiana, would last him far longer. Frank ended up serving a sentence of more than two decades. Last week, the 67-year-old was finally released. His sentence is another result of Louisiana's habitual offenders laws, which allows, uh, which allow prosecutors to seek harsher sentences for lesser crimes if a, dependent, if a defendant has previous convictions. These rules, sometimes known as three strikes laws, have drawn heavy scrutiny for driving uh, mass incarceration and exacerbating racial inequalities in the most incarcerated state in the country. His case shows how poor black people are disproportionately affected by these extreme sentences. The Innocence Project New Orleans, um, which represented Frank, wrote in a statement, it is hard to imagine a white person with resources receiving this sentence for this crime. Now, to be clear, uh, there has been you know, there have been cases where you've had everything from celebrities to, you know, wealthy uh, folk who have had a penchant for stealing, not necessarily even out of necessity, you know, just kleptomania. And they generally don't suffer from these types of three strikes policies. Anyway, continuing on, um, he got life for stealing hedge clippers. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped sentence. Frank wrote in a statement. It's hard to imagine. Yeah. OK, so I did read that. He. Oh, man, I must have skipped a whole portion when I copied it over. My bad. Anyway, um, let me actually go to the piece because the sentence that I skipped, I want to make sure we cover. So bear with me. All right. So here we go. Bop, 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 bop. Um, <laughs> no, actually, that's the way it reads. Damn, I didn't skip it. That's awkward writing. All right. So anyway, so it says uh, Frank writes in a statement. It's hard to imagine a white person with resources receiving the sentence for this crime. He got life for stealing hedge clippers. The Louisiana Supreme Court says it's a fair sentence. Some officials, including Burnett Johnson, the former chief justice of the Louisiana um, Supreme Court, have argued that the state's habitual offender laws can be traced back directly to measures meant to keep black people in poverty. In a uh, dissenting decision last summer, she described how southern states introduced extreme sentences for petty theft, such as stealing cattle and swine in the years following Reconstruction. Right? Uh, these measures, known as pig laws, criminalized poor African-Americans recently freed from slavery and allowed states to sentence people to forced labor. Starting in the 1870s, they caused the black prison population um, in the Deep South to explode, Johnson argued. Um, so basically, this is a critical time period, right? And some argued that Reconstruction was worse than slavery, right? And part of the reason for that is, you know, the South was terribly afraid um, of a couple things. They had a free, newly freed African-American population, Negro population, whatever. Um, and at that time, the whole question of whether or not these new citizens you know, after the the uh, 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment uh, allowed them the not only citizenship, but the option to vote, whether they would upturn the infrastructure of the South, the legal structure, the political structure, all of that. And they were scrambling to figure out how to go about containing this. So they did a couple of things. One, they reduced the voting capacity, the impact of voting for uh, black male voters, because at the time only men could vote. So it was a big question. And prior to that, only wealthy landowning men could vote. But uh, this option of whether or not African-American men could vote, they kind of tamp tamped it down with the uh, three fifths uh, vote clause, which meant that your vote didn't count uh, to the full extent of uh, white voters. And then what they did from there um, is they found a way, a loophole, right, through um, incarceration. 
right? Because basically you have no rights if you are incarcerated for a crime. So they manufactured crime. They manufactured laws that were highly problematic and subject to law enforcement's interpretation, whether you're talking about uh, police, whether you're talking about judges, they could fabricate an entire population of prison labor that were no longer to be treated as citizens. So they had free access to be used, however, much like they were during slavery. So basically the South found a new way to re-enslave an entire population, but doing so under the law after slavery was formally abolished. So this is what they are referring to when they talk about pig laws and other such laws used at the end of slavery to reacquire free labor. And in the last 50 odd years, uh, with the advent of the prison industrial complex, we've seen that same, those same kind of practices from Rockefeller laws onward uh, to mass produce a new free labor population. I mean, because essentially prison workers are sweatshop laborers in other countries, except they're on American soil and it's completely legal, right? So anyway, getting back to the article, although some provisions were wiped away due to major criminal justice legislation in 2017, uh, drastic racial inequalities remain. Black people make up about one third of the Louisiana population, but they account for nearly three quarters of all state prisoners with life sentences. All right. Thousands uh, are serving life sentences in Louisiana. A new case could give them the chance to appeal. A, 20, uh, a 2002 state court decision noted uh, Frank had been arrested 36 times started in starting in 1975 and was convicted several times for theft and possession of cocaine, serving a three year sentence in the 1990s. It is unclear on what charges he was arrested in that case. Uh, it was un OK, that was just weird. All right. Although the Innocence Project New Orleans noted he had never done more than steal in small amounts. But by the time he stole the shirts from Sachs, Frank, a waiter who was then reportedly struggling with addiction, had already been convicted at, of at least three felonies. A trial court in October 2000 denied his motion to suppress the evidence in the theft, uh, and Frank withdrew his initial not guilty plea before entering a guilty plea. That led to his fourth felony offense, according to 2002's decision, which meant the same court could then sentence him to 23 years in prison. He received his egregious sentence despite the fact that he was never a threat to anyone. Right? According to... Uh, to WDSU, the felony theft count on which he, con he was convicted would now be considered a misdemeanor after the law was amended in 2010. After identifying Frank's case, the nonprofit said it advocated to the office of or Orleans Parish District Attorney Jason Roger Williams, a former city councilman who was first elected last fall as a progressive pros prosecutor. Williams appears to have cut off the last three years of Frank's term. His office did not immediately respond to a message from the Washington Post early on Monday. During his time locked up, Frank's mother, wife, son, and two brothers all died, according to a GoFundMe meant to raise money for his post-release expenses. He hopes to become an assistant deacon, the page said, helping and advising others who are struggling. So, let me show you who Frank is here. Um, all right. Oh, that is not Frank. <laughs> that is another. Oh, man, I'm going through it today. You know what? Oh, oh I see what it is. Bear with me. A little technical issue. And it will be resolved right now. All right. Oh man, it is one of those days, I swear. So there's Frank. All right. So Frank is out. And really a lot of this comes down to whether or not you think somebody should spend two decades in, in prison for a nonviolent crime. Especially something as penny ante as shirts and uh you know, clippers and whatnot. You know, it, it, it's supposed to be a deterrent. It's questionable as to what extent it actually is. But, you know, who actually made out more in the deal, the state or Frank? Um, that's an interesting one. It has everything to do with how prison labor in New Orleans is being used. But the point here is that this is egregious and unnecessary. And it's not really something that we tolerate with too many other demographics other than black men, maybe Native American men, maybe, but black men, 
you know, we definitely don't have a problem with them spending 20 years in prison for crap like this. Anyway, hope he does better. Hope we can figure out how not to criminalize the poor and find a better way of dealing with it, but at least one that doesn't require decades of forced labor and incarceration behind nothing. All right, y'all. Peace.